<clears throat> Glad you could come out and be with us this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful morning besides the heat outside. And I got to thinking about the comment that our illustrious song leader made about going outside and doing services out there, and it reminded me of a story. And I know y'all probably heard this story before, but it reminded me of it, and I thought I'd tell it to you again anyway. Uh, one Sunday morning, the preacher was standing there at the door when the services were over and shaking everybody's hand as they were leaving. And there was this one guy who came to church that day, and he was one of those people who never really came to church. He you know, just sort of came once in the blue moon whenever it was a special event or something like that. And people were going out the door and shaking the preacher's hand. Well, that guy made his way up to the preacher, and the preacher shook his hand, and the preacher pulled him over to the side. And the preacher started talking to him, and the preacher said, uh, Brother Frank, I'm concerned about you. He said, Brother, you need to be in the army of the Lord. You, you need to be in the army of the Lord, Frank. And Frank got real quiet, and he looked around. He said, I am in the army of the Lord, preacher. And the preacher told him, he said, well, if you're in the army of the Lord, how come I don't see you here at church except for just, you know, special occasions just here, there, and yonder? He looked around and he said, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> so, you know, what I want us to think about this morning is ways that we can serve God more faithfully in our lives. Now, if you've been with us for the month of June, remember we've been talking about what our purpose is as Christians. I think that one reason that uh, a lot of people are not successful in living for God is the fact that a lot of people don't want to know really what it means to live for God. What are we supposed to do as the church? What are we supposed to do as Christians? What's our purpose? Now, I think some of us have a general idea of what we're supposed to do. You say, well, you know, we're supposed to go out and, you know, teach the gospel. And that's absolutely true, but there's more to it than that. You know, being a faithful Christian has to do with the way that you live every moment of your life. I want you to notice with me again 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, because... In this verse, Peter lays out for us what it is that we need to be doing. First Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. Alright? This verse gives a description of what we are as Christians. What are we to God? Well, this verse says that we are His chosen people. We are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. It gives you a description of the way that we are. But after Peter gives that description of what we are, he then goes on to tell you what we're supposed to be doing. What are we, what are, what's our purpose here? He says that they need to show forth the praises of God. That's what we're here for. Show forth the praises of God. Now, what's that mean? Think about the word praises for just a little bit. That word praises doesn't necessarily mean what we think of when we think about praises. Some people might read this and think, well, this means we go around all day and tell people, well, praise the Lord. Praise. That's not what this means. This word praises actually has reference to the idea of the qualities or the attributes of God. The qualities of God that are praiseworthy. All of the things that God has that are wonderful. This is talking about God's love, God's goodness, God's kindness, God's mercy, God's generosity. We are to show forth those attributes of God in our life. Those praiseworthy qualities that God has, we need to have them as well and show them forth to other people. We need to be a reflection of God. And when people of the world look at us and they see our lives, we need to be giving them a picture of God. I mean, 
Peter said, or rather Paul said in Ephesians chapter 4, that we are supposed to be followers of God. Followers of God as beloved children, imitators of God. We are supposed to be people who our lives revolve around imitating our Heavenly Father. And when we do that, and we live the way that God would have us to live, and we show forth the qualities that God has in our life, if we reflect love, if we reflect kindness and goodness and generosity and mercy, folks, other people take notice of that. Sometimes we think that they don't, but they do. And when people see that in our lives, that's what attracts them to God. Now, I know sometimes we think that we're smarter than God, and we think that what it takes to attract people to obey the gospel is putting on a bunch of gimmicks and a bunch of shows and this, that, and that, and the other. That's what it takes to get people's attention, or at least that's what we think. But God says here that if we do this, if we just simply imitate Him, that's what makes Christianity attractive. Imitating God, not putting on a show, but doing what God says. That's our purpose. And that's how we lead other people to God, by showing them how God really is. And then another thing that we talked about is the fact that if we're going to do this, that we have to be unified in this. This is something that each and every one of us have to do and we have to help one another to do. We need to, each and every single one of us, strive to work together to show the world God's goodness. In Ephesians 4 verse 3, remember that Paul says that we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit. We're supposed to have unity. Unity is one of the greatest qualities that we would ever have as the church. And notice that that verse, Ephesians 4, 3, says that we have to endeavor to keep unity. Folks, unity don't come cheap. Sometimes we think that we can be unified and we don't give any attention at all to unity. I mean, how, 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 I mean just think about it in all, all, in all honesty. How often do you stop and think about how you can get along with other people in the church? How we can all work together to accomplish our goal? Now think about how often we think about things like that versus how often we think about so-and-so wronged us or we didn't like the way so-and-so acted or we're offended that somebody may have done this. You know, I'm ashamed to say it, but sometimes we focus on those things and we never stop to think about, well, how can I get along with so-and-so? How can I talk to so-and-so about our differences and try to work them out? How, how often do we think about that? Ephesians 4.3 says we have to endeavor to keep unity. Endeavoring to keep unity means that we don't just sit there and stew in things and get madder and madder about it and just sit there and think about what so-and-so did to us. It means we try to work things out. Now, folks, that's what it means to be a Christian. We work things out. Well, I don't want to talk about it. I just, I just rather keep, keep quiet and not say nothing about it and just stay mad. Now, where do you read that in the Bible? And then we're going to turn around and tell people we follow God. Well, if we really follow God, then we're going to strive to have unity and to work with one another to accomplish our goal. Our goal is to show forth in our very lives the goodness of God. Our goal is to reflect His attributes and His qualities in our lives, and we've got to do it together. And only when we start doing that are we going to actually begin to be what God wants us to be. Show forth His qualities in our lives and do it together. That's what it takes. Now here's what I want to do this morning. Now that we understand that, let's take this a step further. Let's talk about, very briefly here, some practical ways. Practical ways that we can show forth the goodness of God in our lives. You know, Romans chapter 2, verse number 4, Paul said, The goodness of God leads men to repentance. When people see God's goodness, that can lead them to repent. Well, how do we need to show forth all of these qualities of God in our life? How can, how can we do that? You know, you can sit there and say, Well, preacher, you're telling me to do that, but you need to tell me how to do that. That's exactly right, and that's what we're going to do. All right? I'm not going to let you down here. I'm going to do the traditional preacher way of handling this, I'm going to give you three points. So three points I'm going to give in this lesson about how we can, uh, some practical ways that we can live for God and, and show other people God's goodness in our lives. All right, point number one, and this is something that I think we really need to give attention to. Number one, 
We need to learn to fix our default reactions. Fix your default reactions. What's that mean? What are you talking about? Let me explain. All right, picture this. You're walking down the street. Somebody comes up to you and asks for some money. What's your default reaction to that? They're just scamming me. They're not going to get a dime from me. I know they're up to something. They'll probably use that money for drugs. You're walking down the street and somebody comes up to you and they say something ugly to you. What's your default reaction? Get mad as a hornet. That's usually the way people's default reactions are to things. You know, my husband or my wife did something I didn't like or she said this or this or that and the other and, you know, we have different ways of reacting to that and typically it's usually with just getting upset about it. I didn't like what sister so-and-so said and the common reaction is fuss about it, get mad. And usually we think that getting mad solves problems because we think if we let other people know that we're mad, we'll get what we want. That's kind of the default reaction that a lot of people have, and it doesn't need to be that. Folks, our default reaction needs to be generosity. It needs to be kindness, understanding, and compassion. That's, our, that's what our default reaction needs to be to these kinds of things. When somebody comes up and asks us for help, we don't need to sit there and act like we know their whole life story. Like we just know everything about that person, they're just going to use it for drugs. How do you know that? Well, I, I know if somebody asks me for money. I'll tell you this, I, I hear people say that all the time. Every time, I'll tell you this much right now, every time I've ever done a lesson telling people that we need to be generous and help other people, I always hear people say, well, you know, we can't trust people if they ask us for money. Well, you ever think about this? Here's one way to solve that problem. If somebody comes up to you asking for money for food, if you're worried that they might actually use that money for drugs, why don't you just buy them some food? Because you know if you do that, they're going to have food. But see, the problem with that is we don't want to do the work. It's easier just to hand them a $5 bill and be done with it. We don't like to put in the work. Well, folks, sometimes if you really want to be sure that they're getting what they say they need, give it to them. Oh, they need groceries. Well, I don't feel like taking them. Take them to the grocery store and give them some groceries. That solves the whole problem right there. Do the work. And it's not just people needing help in that way. But it may even be somebody who's a Christian who needs help spiritually. I'm ashamed to say it, but sometimes we even act grudgingly towards that. You know, a Christian comes up and they may need, may need our help, and we just have the attitude of, well, I ain't got time for this. I've got something else I want to do today or whatever. That doesn't need to be our reaction to that. Our reaction to that needs to be generosity. What can I do to help? Is there anything that I can do to help? You know, so we need to honestly think that way. And when somebody does something to us that we don't like or that hurts us, as hard as it may be, our default reaction does not need to be vengeance. Folks, we need to think about it. How, you know, I know this is an old saying that I used to hear a lot back when I was a kid in the 90s, but what would Jesus do? Folks, that's true. Now, I know a lot of people don't like to do that, though. A lot of people don't like to do this because they say, well, if I act this way when this happens, that means I'm a pushover and people are just going to walk all over me. Number one, number one, we sit there and think, well, if I do this, things aren't going to go my way. Number one, sometimes things don't need to go your way. You ever think about that? Sometimes things don't need to go the way that we want it to go. And number two, Jesus, the man who you say is your Lord, he behaved this way. And you know as well as I do, that man was anything but a pushover. Now folks, if he acted that way and we're going to call him our Lord and we're going to say that we're following in his footsteps, walking in the light as he's in the light, then folks, we need to behave the way that this man behaved. Live the way he lived. Treat people the way that he treated them. It doesn't mean you're a pushover at all. It means you're living like Jesus. Now I know what you might be thinking. You're like, well, that's easier said than done. Yeah, you're right. It is easier said than done to do that. I want you to notice a verse with me. Go with me to the Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16 verse 32. It is hard sometimes to control our attitudes. 
And notice what this scripture says. Proverbs 16 verse 32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. If you are a person who can control your attitude, you are mightier than a person who can conquer a city. Now think about how hard it is to, to conquer a city. How much effort that takes to really conquer a city. For an army to do something like that, That's, that takes a lot of effort. That's a hard job to do. Well here the Bible is comparing that to you having the right attitude. The point of the verse is, it can be difficult. No doubt it can be. And when somebody may have wronged us, it is easy just to be mad about it and stew in it and not get over it. Or it's easy if somebody you know, needs help for us to be selfish and not you know, help that person or whatever. It's easy for that. You know, Paul said in Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 11, Paul said in that verse that I have learned that in whatever state I have found myself in, therewith to be content. Philippians 4 verse 11. Now we really need to chew on what that verse is telling us. Because Paul is saying that no matter what situation in life came his way, whether it was good or it was bad, whether it was times of plenty or times of want, Paul said that he had learned, no matter what comes his way, no matter what situation he's in, to be content. He learned to control his reaction to situations in life. But notice what he says there, he had to learn to do that. This ain't something that you get overnight. This is something that you have to learn. And folks, if the Apostle Paul had to learn it, then by all means, we're going to have to learn it. This was a man, Paul, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, and he had to learn to act that way. He had to learn to fix his reaction to situations. And if he had to learn it, then surely we are too. That's something we learn from this. Folks, we have to learn to fix our default reaction to situations in life. To train ourselves to react the way that God would have us to react. And folks, that goes a long way. That goes a long way in us being a shining light in this world. Folks, we need to be people who are easy to get along with. We need to be people who are easy to be around. If we're not easy to be around, if people don't know us for our kindness and our generosity and our love and understanding and mercy, why on earth would anybody want to be around us? We're, what makes us different than the world if we're not going to be this way? If we're not going to be kind and generous, then we're just like the world. And nobody's going to want to be a part of the church. They think, well, I can get all this misbehavior and anger or whatever. I can get all that out there in the world. I don't have to go to the church to get that. So the way that we react to things, the attitude that we display, that goes a long way in living for God and setting an example for the people that are around us. We need to be known for people who are easy to get along with. We need to make sure that we have the right kind of an attitude. Point number two. We need to be on the lookout for opportunities to shine. We need to be on the lookout for opportunities to show people God's goodness. You know, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, We're the light of the world. We're like a city that's set on a hill that cannot be hid. We're supposed to shine as a light. And you know, I hear some people say sometimes that they just don't, they just don't see the point in shining forth to the community because it doesn't do any good or sometimes I hear people say that they don't know how to shine as a light. They just don't know when to do it, how to do it or whatever. But folks, I honestly believe that we have more opportunities to do good than we realize. I think the bottom line is sometimes we don't see these opportunities to shine because we're not really looking for them. We're not really on the lookout for those. I mean, think about the other things that we are on the lookout for. Sometimes many of us are on the lookout for a way to make a quick buck. 
always on the lookout for that. We think about that 24-7. How can I make more money or how can I do this? Or, you know, some of us are always on the lookout for having a good time. Going out and doing this or going out and doing that and hanging out with people, having fun. We're always on the lookout for those kinds of things. Well, imagine if we gave attention to serving God the, the same amount of attention to that as we do these other things. Always on the lookout for opportunities to do things that, that give us pleasure, that we enjoy. But why don't we stop and really be on the lookout for opportunities to live for God and set an example for those people around us. I honestly think that if we would begin to do that and if we would just sit down and examine our life and the people that are around us, we would realize quick, fast, and in a hurry that we've got a lot of opportunities to shine. You know, in Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 10, Paul said that as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those that are the household of faith. As we have opportunity. We have a lot of opportunities around us. We just don't really look for them. And I hear people say all the time, well, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do to, to help other people or to shine as a light. What do you mean you don't know what to do? Look around you. Look at all these people that are around you, out there in the community and the people that you go to, you know, that you're around at work all day. You know, sometimes I hear people say, well, I can't live for God because I'm too busy working. Well, since when did being at work mean that you can't live for God? Since when did going to work mean that we stop being a Christian? You know, we've got to get it through our head that Christianity does not revolve around a building. Sometimes we think that Christianity revolves around this building. And that, that's basically that. And for some people, I'm sad to say it, but that's what their Christianity is boiled down to, coming to a building. It needs to be much more than that because if we honestly have limited our Christianity to a building, then we are really failing. We need to be on the lookout constantly every day for ways that we can serve people, ways that we can be a good example. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 16, that we need to walk circumspectly, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Paul said redeeming the time. In other words, it means using your time wisely. God has given you a limited amount of time here in this world and God will hold us accountable for the way that we have spent our time. We will be held accountable for the way that we have used it. Have we used these opportunities? Have we been on the lookout for these things? Have we strived to help other people? Those are things that we need to honestly think about. So as we move forward and as we live to try, try to live faithful to God, let's make sure that we have the right attitude and let's make sure that we keep our eyes open for ways that we can be a good example and ways that we can serve other people. Now finally, number three. Number three. Let me list for you some things that you can do on a practical, everyday basis. Something, just really briefly, this is not going to be an exhaustive list by any means, but just really briefly, just some ideas and things that we can do to help folks. All right, number one, you want to live for God. You want to go out there and, and convert people and help people to come to the Lord. What are some things that we can do? Now, I hear some people say they don't know what to do, but folks, honestly, that's not true. We know what to do. The problem is many of us just don't want to do it. Why do we not want to do it? Well, there's many different reasons. Some people just don't want to do it because they don't want to do it. Some people don't want to do it because they're, you know, what if folks don't take this the right way? Or what if, you know, what if somebody doesn't like what I'm saying or whatever? And so we sort of let that hinder us sometimes. It really shouldn't. But let me show you some things that we can do. They're really simple, really easy to do. Number one, here's one thing you can do. You can visit some folks. We've all got family members. We've all got people that we are close to that it's not going to hurt anything in the world to just go by and pay that person a visit. What on earth is that going to hurt? We all know somebody in the church who may be a, a member who's drifting away. Or we may know somebody who's not a member of the church who, you know, we ought to go and visit and we'd like to see them convert or we'd like to see them come back to the church. What's it going to hurt? It can't do any harm. They're not being faithful to God anyway. So what's going, visiting, you know, going and paying them a visit and not working going to do? They're already not faithful to God anyway. 
And here's another thing I hear people say, well, I don't like to visit people because I don't really want to come across as pushy. And if I go and visit them, they're just going to think I'm some Bible thumper coming over there trying to cram the Bible down their throat. Well, let me tell you this. Here's an idea. Why don't you just visit the person? If you think they may not like you mentioning the Bible or studying the Bible, then don't mention it. Just go and visit the person and show the person that you care about them. You don't even have to mention studying the Bible to them. Just go and show the person kindness. Show the person that you care about them. And once the person knows that, hey, this is a good person here. They just care about me. They just are thinking about my well-being. Once you show them that, that's going to open the door for you then to bring in, hey, would you mind studying the Bible with me? Would you like to come to services? You know, on your next visit, bring that up. But on your first visit, at least show the person, if nothing else, that you care about them. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just come up to people and just start cramming the Bible on them. Jesus would always show the person some kind of act of kindness. Something that would open them up to receive His Word. And that's something that we can do. Just pay the person a visit. Let them know you care. Come back and visit them again and then bring up coming to a Bible study or something like that. And then I'll mention this to you as well. Let's just say that you can't get out and visit folks. So I just can't get out and visit folks the way that I used to could. My health is not in, you know, I'm not in good a health as I used to be. Or sometimes we just don't want to see the person face to face. Well, luckily, thanks to modern technology, you don't have to. You can make a phone call. I don't want to see that person. Well, you don't have to see them at all. Make a phone call. Or if you don't have a phone, say, I don't want to run up my phone bill. <laughs> okay. Well, you can write a letter. Well, I don't want to spend too much on postage. <laughs> okay. You can send a text message or something. I mean, we got a lot of technology like that today. There's always some way that you can keep in contact with somebody. And sometimes we'll be more straightforward and bold in a letter than we would be face to face. Sometimes face to face we don't want to invite the person to study the Bible but we would do it through a letter. We'll do it through a letter then. You know, in some way or another reach out to people. That's the point here folks. And we have so many different ways available to us today to reach out to people more than ever before. We have no reason not to today. So many different things that we can do. And even if you think, well, I can't serve God. I, you know, I, I can't get out and I can't do that. There's always something you can do. So these are just some things just to think about as we move forward. We've got to understand if we're going to be successful, if you're going to be successful as a Christian, you've got to understand what's my purpose? What am I here for? What am I supposed to be doing? 1 Peter 2.9 you're here to show forth the praises of God. You are on this earth to show people how God really is, to reflect Him in your life. And we need to do that together, unified, all of us doing this. And we need to be on the lookout for ways to do this. We need to make sure that we are demonstrating to the world the right kind of an attitude. And we need to make sure that we are taking advantage of all the different opportunities that we have nowadays more than ever to help folks and to be that shining light that we need to be. If you're here among us this morning and you're not a Christian, then we want you to know as lovingly as we can that you can become a Christian. The Bible says that if you will believe in Jesus, if you will repent of the sins that you have committed, if you will confess Him publicly before men and then be baptized in water, the Bible says that God will forgive you by His grace of all the sins you've ever committed. If you're here, you are a Christian, but you've been struggling and you need help, you need the prayers of the church, then let it be known. If there's any way that we can help you this morning, then please let it be known as together we stand and as we sing.